Hi there. My name is Dr. Tyler Rimfeld, and I'm a recent graduate of Keith Barker's lab at the Bell Museum and the University of Minnesota. I now teach at Regis University in Denver, but I still have several ties to Minnesota through the U and, and through my colleagues that are here. And so what I want to talk with you about today are the deep time origins of Minnesota songbirds. I'm going to translate some of my dissertation research into a story about the origins of our songbirds over evolutionary time. This seems like a fairly lofty, challenging story to tell. How would, I, how would you go about telling this kind of story? The way that I tell it begins in a tube, just like this one. This tube contains muscle tissue, either from you know, the pectoralis, the breast muscle, or from the liver, something like that, from a bird specimen that was collected somewhere in the world um, over the last 50 years or so. The Bell Museum contains thousands of tubes exactly like this that contain samples from birds, from mammals, fishes, reptiles, amphibians from across the entire globe. Using a tube like this and using some fairly simple chemistry in the lab, we can extract DNA from these tissue samples, right? Relatively simple to do, large, huge chunks of DNA. We can target specific points of this DNA, you know, one or a handful of genes, from which we can extract and then generate sequences of that part of the DNA. It would look something like this. You can get this for a whole bunch of different specimens representing many species and then compare them to one another. And by comparing them using a, you know, statistics and combining a little bit of theory, we can turn these different DNA sequences, their similarities and their differences, into a representation of the evolutionary history for that group of animals. And it would look something like this. Let's say that we did this for four birds here, represented on the, on the right side. All of these lines represent hypothetical populations that connect these species together. You can see that the two smaller birds on the bottom are more recently connected. They have shorter populations distancing from each other. That suggests they're clo more closely related to one another than they are to the other two species in this representation. And the same is true as you go further back in time, these lines, these populations are longer and have existed for longer periods of time. They indicate more distant relationships to one another. And this sort of branching relationship, this branching visualization of relationship among species is what we call a phylogeny. And this is gonna form the sort of the, the backbone of all of the analyses that I'll talk with you about today, but many, many more analyses that are possible with this kind of, these kind of data. So let's say we build a tree exactly like that phylogeny, but for seven species that occur in North and South America. We can ask some pretty interesting questions about the evolution of biogeographic ranges or where these species occur and have occurred throughout their evolutionary history. The first step would be simply pointing out where do, these, where do these species currently occur. So each of these tips or each of these bird species are labeled blue or orange, whether they occur in South America or North America, respectively. We can apply an additional set of statistical models and sort of look back in time to infer where these hypothetical populations existed throughout their evolutionary history. This allows us to reconstruct or estimate the ranges of ancestral species and ancestral populations. And this allows us to ask and, and answer pretty interesting questions. For example, if we look all the way on the far left, we see that the base or the root of this tree that gives rise to all other populations is blue. That means that this group likely originated within South America. We can look further at this tree and see how many times this group has dispersed out of its original region. And what we see with this tree is that this group dispersed not once, but twice from South into North America at two different points in the tree, meaning two different populations, and at two different points in time. If we are lucky enough to have fossils of this group, let's say we find a fossil um, of these species in South America, and it lines up with our estimates of the phylogeny, this can sort of give us a habeas corpus or ground truthing to anchor this phylogeny in real geological time. This is kind of rare, admittedly, for songbirds. They don't make very good fossils, but occasionally we are lucky enough to do so. And this whole process of building a phylogeny and inferring the and estimating where this group originated and how they've moved across the globe is called historical biogeography. And this is the set of tools I'm going to be using to talk with you today.
about, about this research and, and telling this story. Now, because we're going to be talking exclusively about the historical biogeography of songbirds, I think it's necessary to clarify some terminology before moving forward. We have three birds lined up here from top to bottom. The top bird is a rifleman, which is an odd red and light bird from New Zealand only. We have our familiar Eastern King bird here in the middle and the ubiquitous Northern Cardinal down at the bottom. All three of these birds are passerines, and they are passerines in that they all belong to the largest avian order alive today, passeriformes, or the perching birds. That's about all I'm going to say about our riflemen. They don't occur in Minnesota, they don't occur outside of New Zealand, not a point of today's talk. Our kingbird here in the middle, though, is what we call a sub -ocene. sub -ocenes are a distinct group or a distinct clade within passeriformes that largely occurs in South America. Uh, they have relatively simple songs, and what's wild about, or what's unique about sub -ocenes is many of them, in fact the majority of them, come genetically preloaded with their songs. There's no learning period. They hatch from the egg, and they already know how to sing their species songs. Minnesota has only a handful of sub -ocenes, like this kingbird here, and I won't talk about them today, but please ask me questions about them on the fifth if you, if you do have questions. Then these are cardinal down here at the bottom. These are the Aussies, or the proper songbirds. And they are proper songbirds because they learn a variety of different songs, and they all have an essential learned component. Aussies are spectacularly diverse. Our northern cardinal represents one of over 3,000 species of Aussies, of songbirds, found throughout the entire globe. And so now shifting gears and actually talking about the historical biogeography of passerines and songbirds as a whole, this field got a big jumpstart thanks to this fellow right here. So this is Keith Barker. He's the curator of genetic resources at the Bell Museum, and he was also my dissertation advisor. Back in 2004, Keith and some colleagues from the American Museum in, in New York published this paper inferring the historical biogeography and the phylogeny of a huge group of passerines. And I read this when I was an undergraduate that originally got me interested in this whole line of research. By sequencing chunks of DNA from tissue specimens, building a phylogeny and looking at their ranges over time, they got a phylogeny that looks like this. Don't worry about the names of the groups here, the names of the branches. Focus on the Aussies there in the center and note that the color is red for that, that, that main ancestral branch and then all of the other populations coming forward from it. What that color means is that songbirds as a whole originated within a region called Australasia, or a landmass that previously contained both Australia and New Guinea. And this research finding has since been reinforced, you know, as, early, as recently as last year, where Keith and a large number of colleagues expanded this sampling effort to include thousands of genes from every family of songbird and passerine as a whole across the entire globe. And despite this much, much larger scale of inference, they came to exactly the same result, that songbirds originated in Australia and New Guinea. This poses an interesting question. How the heck do we have songbirds in North America at all then? This group must have undergone a substantial amount of movement across the globe. And this is where I come in. This question and this topic lingered with me until I got into graduate school and ended up forming a really important foundation of a lot of my dissertation research. So thinking, okay, we know that songbirds originated in Australasia. We know they now occur in North America. There's several questions that need to be answered here. So first of all, how many dispersal events did it take to build up our songbird communities here in Minnesota or you know, the Western Hemisphere as a whole? This happened once, a handful of times, not totally sure. What route did they take? Were they island hopping across the ocean? Did they just fly straight across the ocean? Or was there a large land bridge that connected continents and, and more easily facilitated this movement? And then lastly, when did all of this happen? Was there one specific point in time when all of these birds arrived? Or has this been a more continuous evolving process uh, throughout geologic time? So I applied the same method that I walked us through previously, building a phylogeny or using an existing one to infer the biogeographic history of all songbird groups found within the Western Hemisphere, within North and South America and the Caribbean. What we found was very interesting and very eye-opening. We found that songbirds have dispersed from the Eastern Hemisphere, Eurasia or Africa, 
into the Americas, not once, not twice, but 46, 46 separate times. And this means that a population dispersed from Eurasia or Africa into the Americas and evolved into a distinct species, a minimum of 46 times. And in fact, this has been a continuous process that has taken place over the last 20 to 30 million years. So this has been a long, ongoing and constant process, building up our songbird communities here in the Western Hemisphere. We can visualize this process like so. So this phylogeny is different. Rather than reading it from left to right, you would read it from the center outward. You see the same branching relationships of different colored um, you know, uh, uh, populations. The different colors represent different groups, or what we call different clades, that descend from these dispersal events into the Americas. When you tally this all up, this comprises a remarkable 46 clades, like I mentioned, but 1,300 species, over 10% of all of the bird diversity of the planet. Now, I obviously don't have time to talk with you about all of these examples today, but I am going to share with you some highlights and some fascinating examples related to our birds um, that you would find in, in Minnesota throughout the year. And so, jokingly, for better or worse, we've often heard of Minnesota being compared to a Siberian landscape for the cold, but I would argue this is certainly true um, from a biogeographic perspective, right? Imagine this scene from the Gunflint Trail in, uh, in northern Minnesota. You can imagine a set of songbirds that might occur here. Kinglets, nuthatches, chickadees, waxwings, Canada jay, shrikes, and our brown creeper. What is interesting is that all of these birds that I've shown you here have very, very, very close relatives. They are phylogenetically closely related to species that occur only within temperate and boreal Europe and Asia, or Eurasia. And this is particularly interesting. And I wasn't the first person to notice this. Why is it that so many songbirds in North America in particular have so many close affinities to songbirds in the boreal and temperate zones of Eurasia. And the research that Keith and I performed largely corroborates the finding of other researchers, other biogeographers, that found an important role for this region right here. So the Bering Strait, we know as the body of water that separates Siberia and Alaska in the modern day, but as recently as 10 to 15,000 years ago, there was a physical geologic connection between Eastern Siberia and Western Alaska called the Bering Land Bridge. Connecting Eurasia in North America with a physical body of land. And this land bridge facilitated transcontinental and in fact transhemispheric exchange of a panoply of different organisms throughout the last 10 to 20 million years or so. Some particularly noteworthy, and I find really interesting examples of that, are the fact that camels and horses originally evolved in North America. The only reason that Eurasia and Africa have these species today is because they crossed the Bering Land Bridge. The same is true for elephants and our species, Homo sapiens, both of which originally evolved in Africa, since dispersed into Eurasia and then ultimately to North America via the Bering Land Bridge. When you look at this from the ornithological perspective, what we find is quite interesting. There has almost exclusively been an east to west dispersal of birds, meaning that birds have crossed from Eurasia into North America and very, very, very rarely in the opposite direction. So unless I specify otherwise, know that pretty much all of the songbirds that I'm going to show you in Minnesota descend from some ancestral population that dispersed into the Western Hemisphere across this land bridge, across the Bering Land Bridge, sometime in the, in the near or distant geologic past. And I want to start by talking about a, a caravan of species in the family Corvidae. So I briefly mentioned Canada jays, but Minnesota has five regularly occurring, occurring birds in this family. We have the Canada and the blue jay, black-billed magpie, American crow, and, and the common raven. Now, despite the fact that these five birds are all in the same family, or they all belong to Corvidae, they actually represent five separate dispersal events, meaning their ancestors independently arrived in the Western Hemisphere from Eurasia at different points in time. And they are closely related to a smattering, a whole menagerie of different corvids throughout, throughout the, the Eastern Hemisphere. So a Canada jay, kind of ironically and appropriately enough, is closely related to the Siberian jay, Blue jays, and in fact, all other American jays, are related to a group of corvids, including uh, the choughs and the nutcrackers and this African piapiak down on the bottom. 
our magpie is but a subset of the broader Eurasian group of magpies. And the genus Corvus, including crow and raven-like birds throughout the entire globe, are represented only by our, these two subsets of species, but they're far more diverse and far more widespread outside of Minnesota. And in fact, far more widespread outside of the Western Hemisphere. I now want to tell you a, a story of, of two extremes here. The first beginning with wrens and gnat catchers. Now you may be surprised to see me referring to these two birds together, but gnat catchers are what we call the sister taxon or the closest living relative to the family, including the wrens, Troglodytidae, right? These two birds represent one large group that made it into the, into the Western Hemisphere. And collectively, we may not think of it, but they actually have far greater diversity in the Americas, meaning they have greater ecological diversity. They do more things, forage in more different ways, are put together in different ways, and comprise many, many more species than their close relatives, the tree creepers, found throughout the Eastern Hemisphere. If you've seen a brown creeper, congratulations, you have seen the entirety of all tree creeper diversity. There are 50 shades of brown, they cling to tree bark, they probe for insects. That's about it. Versus with wrens and gnat catchers, we see far greater diversity. Now the opposite is true for the, our gray catbird, the brown thrasher, our Minnesota's only representatives of the family Mimidae or the mockingbird family. This group is actually much less diverse in the Americas when you compare them to their close relatives, the starlings. And here's just a few examples here showcasing the enormous diversity in color and size and bill shape and body structure and habitat usage that you see in this family, the Sternidae. So what this is showing is that there is not a universal outcome of this trans-hemispheric dispersal. Some groups arrive and become spectacularly successful and others pale in comparison to their close relatives, which is quite interesting. Some further surprises come from groups of birds like this, our vireos. And vireos have humbled and stumped ornithologists for decades. Ernst Meyer, a famous ornithologist who took the first stab at figuring out relationships among passerine groups, and in particularly, or in particular, looking at their biogeographic origins in the Western Hemisphere, essentially said, meh, their affinities, their evolutionary relationships to other groups of birds are not totally clear. We don't know who they're related to. And as a result of that, we don't really know where they came from, where they, or where they originated. So they just kind of stopped thinking, man, they just showed up here from some unknown ancestor. Now in comes Sushma Reddy, who is now our Breckenridge Chair and Curator of Ornithology at the Bell Museum. Around the same time that Keith and his colleagues published that paper, Sushma published this uh, short paper showing that old world shrike babblers, birds looking like this right here, actually belong and in fact are the, the closest living relatives to our vireos that we have throughout North and South America. Which means that rather than just appearing in the Western Hemisphere, the closest relatives of vireos occur in tropical South and East Asia, which again implies an Eastern Hemisphere to Western Hemisphere dispersal event. You know, another ornithological mystery solved through the use of phylogenetics and historical biogeography has greatly clarified our understanding of where our vireos came from. Now, I would be remiss to not talk about this group right here, the absolute globe trotters of the avian world. These are the thrushes and the finches and the families Turdidae and Fringillidae, respectively. So on the left here, we have three regularly breeding species in Minnesota and an occasional winter visitor, our Townsend Solitaire. And these birds, these four, represent four of the seven, you heard that right, seven separate dispersal events by the family Turdidae from the Eastern Hemisphere into the Western Hemisphere. What's striking about this is that four of these instances all occurred within the genus Turdus, the genus that contains our American robin. What's more interesting is that our best evidence to date suggests that these birds didn't exclusively use a route across the Bering Land Bridge. There has been repeated transatlantic, transatlantic dispersal, where a group would originate in West Africa, disperse into the Caribbean, produce new species, some of which would end up back in Eurasia, producing new species, then ending up back in the Western Hemisphere. We're talking about at least three or more transatlantic dispersal events with long-term evolutionary outcomes. That is just mind-boggling, absolutely striking. But what is more striking are our finches. 
So you all in Minnesota are getting your winter finches so much better than us here in Denver right now. I'm quite jealous. But all six of these striking birds here, crossbills, grosbeaks of various kinds, the purple finch, goldfinches, and siskins, all represent separate dispersal events by the family Fringillidae into the Americas, into the Western Hemisphere. In total, they made it here nine times, nine separate times, the family Fringillidae has established new breeding populations, giving rise to you and, you and distinct subspecies or full species. And to further drive home the, the globe-trotting nature of these, oh, oh, excuse me, jumping ahead of myself. To further drive home the globe-trotting nature of these two groups of birds, I want to show you these two here on the bottom. So on the left in the, the black border, we have a thrush called the Pueyohi, and the, the red bird with the curved bill is called the Iiwi. These two species are endemic, meaning found nowhere else in the world than the Hawaiian archipelago. They represent the families Turdidae and Fringillidae, which are two of the only groups of passerines to have ever dispersed to and evolved new species within the Hawaiian archipelago. If these birds can successfully make it to the most isolated land masses in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it's no wonder that they have repeatedly colonized and produced new species within the Western Hemisphere. So this, the globe charting nature of these birds cannot be cannot be overstated. It's simply, simply remarkable world travelers. But I want to talk about another more remarkable group of birds here for a second. You may be surprised to see such a huge, diverse menagerie of songbirds here. So what gives? I talked individually about finches here, thrushes here, wrens here. Why am I now showing you warblers, meadowlarks, tanagers, buntings, cardinals, sparrows, blackbirds, all on the same slide? That seems nonsensical. But as it turns out, all of these birds, despite how different they appear and how differently they behave, all descend from a single common ancestor. They're all more closely related to one another than any other group of bird. And this common ancestor appears to have dispersed from Eastern Asia into North America on the order of 15 to 20 million years ago. Collectively, they belong to what we call a superfamily, and this superfamily's name is Emberizoidea. So Emberizoidea, as I showed you on the previous slide, contains all of Minnesota's warblers, blackbirds, sparrows, cardinals, long spurs, tanagers, grosbeaks, and so on. This group also contains the proper tanagers found within the tropics of, the, of, of North and South America, as well as a number of bizarre singletons hanging out in the islands of the Caribbean. These pictures here represent a brief vignette of the remarkable diversity within Emberizoids, and I call it a vignette because collectively this group contains over 800 species that range from the northernmost slopes of Alaska to the southernmost islands of Tierra del Fuego and every habitat in between. They also are one of the oldest songbird groups in the Americas, meaning they dispersed into this hemisphere far earlier than many, many other groups did. But they ended up becoming a sort of focus of my dissertation research because they are so superlative. And I wanna take, take some time here to put some numbers and quantitative data to talk about how striking this group's diversity is. The first plot I'm gonna show you here has colonization timing, or how long this group has been in the Western Hemisphere on the horizontal axis. The number of species in that group is represented by numbers on the vertical axis. Each of these black points in this plot represents one of those 46 separate groups that I mentioned that dispersed from the, Western Hem or from the Eastern into the Western Hemisphere and gave rise to new species. Our red line in the center represents the, the best fitting relationship between colonization timing and the number of species a group has, with the gray lines representing some error in that estimate. Can you guess which of these points represents emberizoids? Unsurprisingly, they're way at the top. And what this means is that they have far greater or a far larger number of species than we would expect given how old they are. And this translates into them having really fast rates of species formation, or what we call diversification. This superlative diversity is also reflected in their morphology and how they are put together, their shape, their size, and their function. So what you see here is it's a little tough to make out, but we have two distributions of size scores or approximations of body size variation. There's a black distribution in the backdrop and a red distribution in the foreground. The black represents the entirety of all songbirds in the Western Hemisphere. The red represents Emberizoidea only. The fact that these overlap nearly one to one means that Emberizoids have evolved to comprise the entirety of size variation expressed within songbirds in the Western Hemisphere. 
we have emberizoids ranging from eight grams to 450 grams in this, in this hemisphere. It's a shocking amount of diversity. And the same is true for their shape. So how large is the bill relative to the length of the wing? How are they differently shaped? Looking at their wings, their legs, their tails, their bills, their total body, et cetera. And again, gray points represent our uh, entire songbird community in the Western Hemisphere. Red represents only the emberizoids. And when you put numbers to this, emberizoids have evolved over 50% of the total ecological diversity realized by songbirds in this, in this hemisphere. That is just shocking. No other group has come anywhere close to achieving this diversity. And Keith and I have put forward the argument that this has come about as a result of emberizoidia's old age, or length of time here, their relatively high rates of species formation, and the fact that their ancestor was likely a generalist, so a sparrow or a finch or a grosbeak-like bird, that granted them evolutionary avenues to explore new diets. This sort of landed them with an evolutionary jackpot and gave them an evolutionary edge that may explain why this group is just so much more diverse than anything else in this whole hemisphere. Now, we've been talking about interesting and exciting natural dispersal events, but I want to shift gears here and finish up by talking about human assisted dispersal events. So, the family Sternidae, represented by our European starling on the bottom here, and the family Passeridae, represented by our house sparrow up top, never made it into the Western Hemisphere on their own. And the same is true with widow birds, with weavers, with bubbles, and with mannequins. None of these birds made it to the Western Hemisphere on their own. Humans brought them over. And these birds have since established breeding populations within the Western Hemisphere. And some of these, including the European starling and the house sparrow, certainly are ubiquitous, and especially so in Minnesota. But I want to talk about this house sparrow for a second. If you don't know the history of this group in the Western Hemisphere, it's really interesting. So in the early to mid 1800s, a handful of flocks ranging a few dozen individuals were introduced into a few cities in, in Eastern North America and throughout the hemisphere. Fast forward about 200 years and those few dozen individual birds have given rise to a hemisphere wide takeover, more or less. This figure is from eBird, where purple indicates the presence of house sparrows and the darkness of that color indicates their abundance. Darker colors meaning there are more of them. These few introduction events have led to a hemisphere-wide domination of house sparrows. They are everywhere and they are in very large numbers. But I don't want you to think about this as a single fixed population occurring throughout the entire hemisphere. This paper from the 1960s showed that if you measure wing length, which is used as a, as a proxy for flight ability, for dispersal ability, in populations of house sparrows on a north to south gradient, right, say from Edmonton in Canada to Death Valley in Southern California, you can see an adaptive response. These birds are actually evolving. Their wing lengths are changing and adapting to the environments that they occur in. So in the span of 150 years, not millions of years, literally hundreds of years, we are seeing these birds evolve and adapt to the enormous disparity of environments we have in the Western Hemisphere. A hypothetical example or a scenario I, I, I want to leave you lingering with is what happens when we fast over the clock 10 million years from today? Will the house sparrow ultimately go extinct? Will it be outcompeted by native species? Or have we sort of set the foundations for another emberizoidia like massive diversification event? These are fun things to wonder. I don't think there's an answer to this question. I'm certainly not going to be here 10 million years from now to, to learn the answer to this question. But just think about this. And what I want you to realize here is that the, the songbird communities we have here have been stitched together over a long period of time, but this is, this is far from over. Some major takeaways I hope that you've learned throughout this, this story that I've been telling today is that through my research here at the Bell Museum and throughout um, natural history collections, we found that Minnesota songbirds communities descend from dozens of dispersal events into the Americas from the Eastern Hemisphere, either from Eurasia or Africa. The vast majority of these took place across the Bering Land Bridge with a few intrepid dispersal events across the Atlantic Ocean. This process started 20 to 30 million years ago and it's taken that long to give rise to the songbird communities that we adore and we look forward to seeing every spring and winter. But this process has not stopped, not by a long shot. Our activities, 
natural dispersal events, and ongoing accelerated climate change are undoubtedly going to continue driving the evolution of, Minas of, of passerines within Minnesota, but, but the world as a whole. So this story that I told you today is maybe the first of an endless number of chapters that have yet to be written. And I'm, I'm excited to see what, what may become of, of our songbird communities throughout you know, my lifetime and, and lifetimes beyond. Being able to tell this story depends upon a lot of people, giving feedback, providing a mentorship and advice on how to conduct this research, providing funding and access to specimens without which this research is impossible to tell. So the Bell Museum here in the University of Minnesota is an absolutely indispensable research or resource for being able to conduct resource, re, blah, research like this and tell stories like this one that I just shared with you today. I am looking forward to answering any questions you may have about this. Um, if you do have questions in the meantime, get in touch with me. Here's my email address or my Twitter handle. I'm looking forward to talking with you all um, uh, later in December. So. Take care until then.